And if I had not responded to one of Judy's uh, uh, lieutenants who reached out to me and said, could I be helpful in Europe for a part of her business, then I wouldn't have met Judy. Um, so I guess one of my lessons is always to, uh, to follow up and connect and just have those conversations because I've met some of the most interesting people uh, by just responding and connecting and so forth. Judy um, is a relatively new friend of Renee and I as we've gotten to know her. She uh, ha comes over from Missouri to be with us today. She's got uh, an absolutely fascinating platform. Um, I remember when Renee started looking at uh, the returns of her, her fund and said, you know, my God, she's just really seriously doing well. She is a uh, Harvard. She is a, an entrepreneur. You've got a, a fantastic story. I'm so pleased that you were willing to come over. I know you really had to make it work between all of your travels. Would you please welcome Judy Syndicuse to the stage? Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you, Julie and Renee. I mean, this is incredible. And I don't want to go overboard here, but, uh, but this is amazing. I mean, between the location that we're at and all of you cool people that I've met, I mean, really, it's making me appreciate this world uh, and, and how fortunate I am. So, so thank you both so much. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the future of Series A investments. Uh, there's some trends happening right now that are converging to create this incredible opportunity that doesn't happen that often. And we all know that Timing is everything uh, when, you're, when you're talking about this kind of success. And the timing on what's going on right now is just perfect. Uh, but before I, um, what am I doing? Just turning the green. Before I go into the, the details on that, let me give you just a little bit more of my background. Uh, so I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, which is right in the middle of the United States. And, uh, and then for schooling, I went to Dallas, Texas. I got a degree in mechanical engineering, and then I went to Harvard Law School. Uh, after I graduated from law school, I went back to Dallas to practice law. I made it almost a whole year as an attorney before <laughs> I came up with an idea for a business. Uh, I left the practice of law to start that business, but it wasn't my first business. My first business I started while I was in college. I sold it to go to law school. Anyway, I start this business. While I'm doing that business, I had a problem in the business. When I solved that, I sold that solution to other people. That was my next business. I did that another three times over. So I had started six different businesses before I started doing what I'm doing now. I think that becomes very important with what I'm talking about later on. Uh, how I fell into what I'm doing now uh, is uh, it was uh, basically I was trying to help a nonprofit solve a problem that they had where they were helping very early stage tech companies. But what I saw was that these tech companies weren't getting the funding that they needed and they weren't getting the mentorship that they needed. So having been an operator six times over, I felt like I knew what an entrepreneur needed to, to move their business forward and, the, and they weren't getting it. So I created uh, something that was later to become known as an accelerator. So I'm sure that most of you know what an accelerator is. For those of you that don't, this is uh, a program, like a boot camp style program, where an early stage company comes and offices with you and they get mentorship and uh, free perks and a lot of assistance, including uh, money in exchange for equity in order to help grow their business. Uh, so Capital Innovators is the name of my company, the name of my accelerator, and we run three different accelerators a year. Uh, each one is 12 weeks apiece. Um, we see applications for this program. Our applications, we get about 1,000 a year. It's really more like 1,200. They come from over 60 different countries, um, almost every state in the United States. Uh, it's just really incredible, the deals that we see. Uh, one of the reasons why we're able to see so much deal flow is because we do have a, a top-ranked program. And one of the reasons we have a top-ranked program is because we take a very different approach from most accelerators. There, there's been this explosion of accelerators around the world, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but most of them have done this copycat model where they, they get all of these mentors, people that have... Uh, been there and done that in their own lives and come back and try to help their companies. But I don't think they deliver uh, the expertise correctly. So what we do in our program, it's a very hands-on approach. We build teams of these great mentors, like I have the ex-CTO of Disney and the ex-Chief Knowledge Officer of HOK 
and uh, the XVP of Energizer. Uh, there's these major players that all come together and fill different purposes. So I'll have somebody that, uh, that, that's that been very big on technology, somebody that's very big in operations, somebody very big in marketing, and we basically build the C-level team that we then use to help the entrepreneur figure out how they're going to wear all of those hats. And importantly, how do they prioritize everything that they need to do? And we do it in a very programmatic fashion, and we make them deliver to us everything that they're doing every day, every week, and we help them learn how to take all the massive amounts of information that they're taking in from these great mentors and all of the massive, like their, their task list that's this long on everything they do, they do and figure out how to prioritize it and put metrics behind it so at the end of each week, they really know if they're moving their business forward. The biggest danger for an entrepreneur is they're very, very busy. They don't sleep. They're working really hard, but their business isn't going anywhere. It has no direction. It's like speed without velocity. And, uh, and so we really try to teach the entrepreneur to do that. We've done very well with the accelerator program. Um, I've invested in 119 companies at the very earliest stages. We have an 85% success rate. They're still operating. That's unheard of in this space. I'll give you an example. The top accelerator in Los Angeles, California, really one of the well-known accelerators, has a 70% failure rate. So it, it's, a, it's a huge difference. Uh, we've uh, had $330 million in follow-on funding, over 1,000 jobs. Um, top ranked uh, over the last five years. It's the only five years they've had rankings. Uh, so we're very proud of that. We are the only accelerator that's not located on a coast in the U.S. that has achieved a top ranking. And, uh, and we've been number one in several categories that they rank on. And one of the categories I'm most proud of is the, the people that do the rankings, they poll all of the participants in accelerator programs, and they ask them, was the program worth the equity that you gave up in order to participate? And we're the only ones that have a 100% yes response rate. So it's, thanks. <laughs> thanks. So I, I'm very proud of the program that we've created. Now let me get to the point of, uh, of all of that. Um, so one of the things that's happening is this explosion of accelerators, right? Just since 2010, uh, there, there have been estimates over 2,000 accelerators around the world. Some say it's even 8,000 or 9,000 accelerators, depending on how you define the word accelerator. So think about all of these accelerators and, and what they're doing to help these companies. Uh, it's w whether they do something the way I do it or they do something otherwise, it has been shown, it's proof, that if you are a startup that has gone through accelerator programs, you tend to have higher growth rates, you can raise more capital, you create more jobs, you attract more talent. I mean, these are facts. If you're an angel investor and you're investing in a company that hasn't gone through an accelerator program, you're really taking a much higher risk with that, that company. It's almost like accelerators have become sort of the college or, or university of the system. So they're, they're so prevalent now uh, that, that anybody can find an accelerator to help them in their growth. And, and just like we as employers, uh, w you know, we know that if somebody hasn't gone to college or attended university, they may still make a great employee, right? It doesn't mean that you're not going to be a good employee. But when we're hiring, we tend to look at the people who have gone through that training first. And, and why is that? Well, they've already been vetted, they've already been trained, they've learned so much, they've learned how to deal with authority, they've learned how to make it through a program, how to persevere. There's all these pluses that you get when you have somebody who's attended a college or university, so, so why not start there? And that's what's happening around the world of angel investing now, too, is people are looking to accelerators for that. And then just like colleges and universities, you tend to, to want to get the companies that have attended the top accelerators, just like if you, um, uh, you know, choose somebody who's attended a top university, you feel like they've been vetted through a more competitive analysis, so you're going to be getting a, a better company. The other thing that's happening, the other trend that's going on is, uh, is that there's more money, I know this is a confusing chart, but what this chart is telling you is that the traditional VCs are, are not uh, investing at the lowest stages uh, where 
uh, where the, the entrepreneurs are needing money. So these entrepreneurs are getting through their, their friends and family round and that initial angel round, and they're getting to the point where they're raising about one to three million dollars. And that's too high of a ticket to piece together from your angels and your friends and your family. But it's too low for a traditional VC to be interested. Uh, I think a couple of the reasons why this is happening uh, is, uh, one, that these traditional VCs are raising more and more capital as more people are getting interested in the space. And in order to deploy that capital effectively, they have to go a little bit further downstream uh, so they can take bigger ticket sizes, right? And so it's leaving this huge gap. The other thing is, is traditional VCs aren't generally operators like me, people who have grown companies. It's people who, uh, you know, uh, studied investment banking or got an MBA and are, are really knowledgeable about analyzing markets and, and doing things like that, but not about true operations. And they, they went, you can see on this chart, like I said, again, it's a little confusing, but a few years back, some of these traditional VCs tried to lower that and, and step in and invest in these spaces, these earlier spaces, and they didn't do very well. And that was really because they weren't, in my mind, they weren't paying attention, and this is from personal experience, they weren't really paying attention to those smaller investments because their larger ones were getting their senior uh, leaders and it was the juniors that were doing this. And also, like I said before, they just didn't have the operational expertise that is necessary at that stage. These founders still need training. Uh, they don't just need connections and money, they need training. Uh, so the VCs have stepped back out of that space. And so what has happened then is you have this excellent convergence that's creating this huge opportunity. If you have 2,000 accelerators pumping out hundreds of these companies that have had all this massive training and are really doing well, and they're getting, they're, as they come out of the accelerator, they're getting to this point where they need this one to three million dollars. But you have these VCs that aren't interested in that. It means that you have this massive amount of incredible deal flow and no competition for it. So that's where we want to step in and say this is where this huge opportunity is that doesn't occur all the time. It's occurring right now. <clears throat> so how do you capture this opportunity? That's the trick. It really, really helps if you can develop a close relationship with the, the, a handful of accelerators that are putting out these, these companies. And the reason why you need this, uh, this close relationship is so you can leverage three things that, uh, that accelerators can provide. One, you're leveraging the work they've already done. Like I talked about earlier about it, comparing it to a college. If you think about a college that's looking through, you know, 15,000 applications from students and they're narrowing it down to accept a class of 1,000, you know, when we're talking about these top universities, you know, they're doing a lot of due diligence and that's what's happening also inside these accelerators. So I see those 1,000 deals. Out of those 1,000 deals, I'm investing in 18 companies a year. So this, this very selective process, and we're looking at these companies uh, and, and, and really um, working hard to determine who, out of all of those thousand, uh, are the very top companies. So you're already getting the advantage of that when you work with them. The next thing is, is that process that I said. They're getting the training that they need from these top uh, people in the world that have all of this experience. So you're getting somebody that has already been trained by the best in the world. And also importantly is while they're in the accelerator, one of the main things that they're doing is validating their market. They're testing. They're, they're using the lean canvas and they're learning how to test and iterate and they're perfecting their product and they're making sure that they found the proper product market fit. Uh, something that you really want before you scale up a company, you've got to have that problem solved and the accelerators are already doing that work for you. Uh, so, so if you leverage all of that work, it saves you. The next thing is leveraging the accelerator's management. Now I'm gonna tell you something that I normally wouldn't tell a public audience. I would only tell my investors. But of my 119 portfolio companies, not all of them are winners. <laughs> There's uh, a handful that are superstars, right? They are just rocking it. They took off out of the gate. There's this other handful that are challenged. They're not doing very well. Maybe they'll pivot, maybe they'll figure something out, maybe they won't fail, 
but likely I'm going to have some failures. Then there's all these in the middle that just haven't had time to figure out, are they going to be a superstar or are they going to fail? We don't know who those are, right? So for this opportunity at this convergence, what you want are the superstars. So how do you know who the superstars are? And nobody like me is going to sit and tell you, these are my superstars. Because if I tell you these are my superstars, then I've screwed <laughs> that middle group. I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot. Because that middle group might have some superstars in it, but if they don't get the funding and the help behind them to allow them to become a superstar, and if you're investing, they're not going to get the money if I've signaled that these are my superstars. They're going to just, and I'm going to cause all of them to, so I won't tell you that. But if you're my best friend, then maybe I will. <laughs> And so that's why you have to really get in there and develop a close relationship with the accelerators so that you can get them to tell you who are the superstars because that's who you want to invest in right now to take best advantage of that opportunity. The other thing that you get when you get close with that is you get the insights that you can't get through regular due diligence. So if you're an angel investor and you just go talk to a company, they're very good at pitching. They're very good at telling you, you know, what their business is about. And I think somebody mentioned how they're the, they're the number one in their industry and things like that. And sometimes it can be very difficult to decipher what you're really getting. And then I think the, the key thing here is understanding the founders themselves. And this is something that I just don't think there's any other way to do it rather than to work side by side. So when somebody goes through my accelerator program, they literally put their desk next to mine. And I get to see what is their work ethic. When do they come in in the morning? When do they leave at night? I get to listen to them make sales calls on the phone. You know, how good are they at it? I know um, things like uh, their, their ethics. When they were negotiating with me, did they negotiate above board? Uh, I know, uh, really importantly, how much grit do they have? When they face challenges, do they go into a panic mode? Do they freeze up? Or, or do they, you know, really persevere and understand that nothing is going to stop them? You know, failure is not an option here. We're going to figure it out. Um, it's uh, the, the amount of insights I get from working right next to them is just incredible. And when you're investing at this stage, it's not just about the idea, it's about the founder. There's really no unique ideas out there anymore. You know, every pitch I hear, I've already heard before. It's about who's going to take that good idea and drive it to a tipping point, right? Who's going to make it far enough that they're really going to make some money at this? So you've got to bet on the founder. And how do you get to know the founder? It's through working with them. So that's another reason to, to leverage uh, that. So, so basically, you're, you're using these accelerators in order to capture these really choice deals. Uh, and, and that's a strategy that, that any of you guys can do. You get to know these accelerators. You do this. Of course, we're, we're doing it ourselves. Um, my first fund was a seed stage only fund. The next fund, we added on some follow-on funding. I'm currently raising our third fund to take advantage of this opportunity that I'm describing. I'm doing it right now by utilizing not just my own companies that have gone through the program. That's fine, but that's not enough. There's these thousands of great companies out there. They didn't all go through my program. They've gone through other accelerator programs, and I'm connected to the top 80 accelerators in the world, and I have a very, very close connection to the top six in the United States. So close that we go on a retreat every year in Denver, we, buy a we rent a house together, we share best practices, we communicate with each other at least quarterly, uh, usually it's more like monthly. We share each other's best practices. We really know each other. These are the people, we, we speak the same language. I can ferret out who are their superstars, who needs that money, and, uh, and, and this is how we're going to utilize this. Importantly, in my third fund, we're going to go ahead and keep investing at that earliest stage as well. It'll be a very small portion by percentage of the amount of dollars in the fund. Uh, but we're doing that because it's also incredible what you can, when you're an accelerator, what you can do as an accelerator that you can't do as a v just a regular VC or an angel investor. I'll give you an example. One time a company came to me with this uh, new sensor device 
that a woman could wear on her ponytail holder or her headband that would measure head impacts when she plays soccer. So this is a big thing, right? Uh, the, the head impact and the brain injury. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is a great idea, right? Everybody's paying attention in the United States to football uh, and, uh, and, and the helmets and putting sensors in helmets, but how are we protecting our girls out on the field, on the soccer field? Because they're getting concussions too. And, uh, but, but even though I'm a mechanical engineer, I don't really know what's at the forefront of this sensor technology. Like, is this going to measure just an impact? What about rotational impact? You know, how is the sensor going to work? So, so who can I talk to? So there is a, a university, Washington University, that is at the forefront of this sensor technology and head impact, right? So I pick up the phone and I call the lead professor on this. If I called the lead professor as a VC, this professor I don't know, and called him and just said, hey, I'm a VC, and I'm looking at investing in this company, will you tell me if this sensor technology is good or not? They'd be like, no, who are you? But because I'm an accelerator, and because accelerators are looked at almost like nonprofits, even though they're not, and, and they're just trying to help startups, and they're trying to help communities. Because of that, the professor's like, sure. And he gives me this whole rundown analysis on head impacts and how this can play into it. And it's really amazing. And those relationships, even if I'm calling about one of my Series A investments, so this isn't like I'm, I'm just helping to promote something. I mean, this is all about making money. This professor doesn't know that all he hears is accelerator and he opens up the doors and, and it's really quite amazing. Uh, so, so that's also another advantage uh, that we have by doing that, uh, uh, those relationships and that. And, uh, and so I'm just, I'm so bullish on this idea. Uh, there's enough deal flow for a lot of people. I think everybody should be looking at this space. One other thing, and this is in closing, the really great thing about this space too is you're still getting in a company early enough that there's this huge upside potential. And this is important from making man money standpoint, there's additional ways to find liquidity that you can't get if you invest downstream more. Because I can sell my shares to a later stage investor. And that improves my IRR because I can get in and get out faster. I don't have to wait for the IPO. I don't have to wait all the way until the, the final sale of the company. Really important to that bottom line IRR. Uh, so, so just an excellent space. We've de-risked it because at that one to $3 million stage, we found that product market fit. But there's still this huge upside. Really incredible. Thank you so much for listening. You are exceptional. Thanks. Have a seat here. Um, I mean, really, that is exceptional. You are amazing, and I know everybody <laughs> in the audience is thinking the Thank same you. thought. Um, I've got a question, but if somebody is, is wants to, Malcolm, please go. Um, I have two questions, mm -hmm. so, so I'll ask the second one, or perhaps not, after you answer the first one. Uh, you're talking for this six-week program on doing that for equity. What 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 would somebody pay in terms of equity to go through that six week course? It's it's a twelve week course. Oh, sorry, twelve. It's week a twelve course, week sorry. course. Mm -hmm. And what we do, the way we structure it, is the fund will invest a hundred thousand dollars into your company. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, we take between five and ten percent, but it's negotiable and it's dependent upon what stage your company is at. So okay. if you've mm -hmm. already had, uh, have quite a few customers, let's say you've mm -hmm. made $300,000, you'll get more like the 5%. If you're somebody that just has one customer, you've proven your market, but you really haven't, y you haven't really established yourself, you're gonna be more in that 10% range. Occasionally, we'll go with somebody who's much further along that still wants to come into the program, even though they've figured things out. It's usually because they've just made a pivot or they've changed uh, who they're marketing to because they found they hit a wall too soon, so they're needing some help with that. We'll do something a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we turn around, we give them the $100,000 for that equity, but we then turn around and charge them $50,000 to go through of that 100, so we give them the 100, then, but 50 of that they use to give back to us, and that pays our operating expenses for the program. Okay, so my second question, um, and uh, I hope my talk this afternoon is a tenth as good as what you've do oh. just done. <laughs> I know, it's um, amazing. Is, is what, I'm, what I'm doing is something that's complementary to what you're uh -huh. doing, but we have the same issue. 
which is we're getting something like the 85% as well, mm -hmm. and we're getting equity 5 to 10%, so very similar to you. And my business partner says, why are we giving away all of the value in exchange for such small percentage of equity? We, if, if you're changing a model, the broken startup model of one success out of 10 professionally funded to 85%, you're creating all the value, it's not the entrepreneur. So why aren't you taking 80%? <laughs> hmm? Well, it's, it's market-driven, right? I haven't driven, answered right? it yet. No, yeah. it's market-driven. So yeah. it, it's definitely the market. When I, per, when I started that first company after law school, the, the, the landscape for venture capital, because I went out to, I, I did all of my, I bootstrapped every one of my companies. And this is why, because back in the, and this is gonna age me, this was in the early 90s. Back in the early 90s, Venture capitalists took 90% of your company. You became an employee. They owned 90, you kept 10, straight up. And they weren't helping you like we're helping now. That was just to get the money. And I thought, no way, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, to this day, I'm not sure that was the right decision because without the money, I couldn't grow as fast as I could have had I had the money. You know, they always say that the, the thing is, is 10% uh, of, of something is more than 0% of nothing. Uh, so I don't know, even looking backwards, but it's just the market has changed, and so we have to play in the market. My competitors, right, are offering these deals, so I can be on the top side of the deal, and I am. I can tell you some of the valuations that um, I hear in Europe remind me of the valuations in Silicon Valley, which is they're way too high. It's just too high. I won't do it. That's not a good deal for me. I run the numbers. You might have a fantastic company. More power to you. You're going to be a great success. But it's not a good deal for me and my fund if your valuation is too high, even if you're successful. So you have to also run those deal numbers. So it's, I can be on that high side, and I do take a little bit more equity. I take preferred interest, even at a very early stage. Not a preferred interest, it's really preferred um, on I protect my downside. I don't try to take advantage of, uh, you know, I participate in, as common stock if people are successful. I believe in fairness. I think you have to take a long, if you're in this business, I think as a VC, you have to take the long view. You have to be a good VC, you have to be good to the founders. Founders talk. This is a closed world now. Everybody communicates with everybody. Founders will talk to each other about, were you a good VC or were you a shark? You know, were you a bad VC? Did you press your thumb down on me? Were you awful to me? And, and then the best companies, if you think about it, the very best uh, uh, new companies that are out there, they have a choice on where they go to take their money. There's competition for them. And I want them to choose me. And the way to get them to choose me is for me to be good to them. And one way to be good to them is to make sure that my deals are very fair. And so when there's not a meeting of the minds on what is very fair, then we just walk away from the deal. Uh, it's not all about who's going to be a successful company. It's all about what's a good deal. We talked yesterday, and I think it'd be interesting for the, the audience and to know a little bit about the, the benefit of being in the, in the Midwest. Just, just share a little bit more about that. Do you think it's a... Is it neutral or is it a real advantage? How do you perceive it? I think in the early stages of a company, uh, growing your company in the Midwest of the United States is incredible. First of all, uh, the cost of doing business in St. Louis is 20% what it is in Boston or Silicon Valley. 20%. That means your capital, that $50,000 they get from me, feels more like 250000 And at this stage, we all know this, the highest risk for any startup is undercapitalization. Great companies die all the time because they don't get the funding. And, uh, and so if you can make your money go further, then that's gonna mitigate that risk. But it's not just about that side of it. There's also the upside. You don't have to go through a, a C round, a D round, an E round, because you can get on an A or a B round, you can get all the way to an exit. You can get all the way to liquidity with just a couple of rounds. So as an investor, you're also making more money because you've suffered way less dilution when you're growing a company there. So, so that's really important. But I do feel like I need to state that when we invest in later stage companies, if they're already well established where they are, we leave them where they are. We don't move them to St. Louis. We don't re most 
most VCs in Silicon Valley still require you to move to the valley. They don't want to drive more than 20 minutes. That's the thing. They don't want to drive more than 20 minutes to come see you in person. Some are starting to venture out and say, like, partner with me and say, well, if you're 20 minutes from them, we'll co-invest with you and we'll make sure you're babysitting this company for us. Uh, but that, that's a trend that's only just now sort of picking up some pace. Uh, most VCs want to be right there. We understand that this is a virtual world. There is a way to keep track of your, your portfolio if you know how to do it and, and if you're well versed in, in how to feel like you're in person. And, uh, and we think if you're well established, your team's well established, it doesn't make sense to uproot you. So when we invest around the world, and we have invested around the world, um, everywhere from Singapore to Mexico to France, uh, England, uh, we leave you where you are. So congratulations, a phenomenal model, Judy. Thank you. And where have you been all my life? <laughs> <laughs> professionally speaking, professionally. Well, the timing yeah. is now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just a quick question. So when you're looking at leading um, the series, would you, would you lead the series A, or would you syndicate it and have someone else price that? And I think it would company? be a mix. Uh, I, I definitely want to look at co-investing in almost every situation. I don't want to be the only investor in at that stage because I want people with, co with connections that complement mine. I don't know everybody that I need to know in order to be helpful. And if there's another investor that's connected in the space, particularly if they have some vertical expertise. So I'm vertical agnostic. We try to hedge across all the different verticals. We invest mostly in tech. Uh, but we do do about 10 to 12 percent in consumer products. Uh, that's a growing area for me. I'm really falling in love with it. Uh, uh, but but mostly tech. But you know, it's it's fintech, it's blockchain, uh, it's it's B2B, it's anything with a practical business model that delivers a real ROI that you can touch and feel. Uh, that's another thing about the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Midwest. Uh, did you know? So Missouri, the state I come from, we all have the states all have nicknames. And our nickname is the show me state. And the show me state, it means we don't believe you, <laughs> you have to show me. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so we, uh, we require very practical business models. Sorry, that's just an aside. But no, co-investing, co I think, is the right way to go. And so which one of us is going to lead, it, it's just who's up for that. I'm never afraid of leading. I'm always wondering why people are afraid of leading deals. I know what I want to value this company at. I know what the terms should be. I don't need somebody else to lead. I would only, somebody else would lead because they just really want to. But I will always take a board seat, for sure. Any other question for Judy? Have you thought about, like, uh, please, Alex, go ahead. Alex. Thank you for sharing your really unique business model and approach. Um, how much of your um, deal flow, business, investment goes into international companies that you can take back to the United States and help them scale faster over there? Because that seems to be another trend. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so with this next fund, we, we've done about 10% uh, international uh, so far. Mm -hmm. But with this next fund, I'm really looking for I, that's one of the reasons why I want to do this is in this deal flow that I'm seeing, mm -hmm. I'm seeing just fabulous companies from around the world. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I want to do with this next fund, and it's one of the reasons why I'm here, frankly, mm -hmm. is I, I want to create more international relationships. I need some international LPs, mm -hmm. you know, that will help me build those bridges. Mm -hmm. There are companies there that want to come to the United States and expand. I have companies in the United States that need to expand globally. Uh, in the United States, I think we have a real problem. You know, you're, we're very uh, egocentric with our geography, right? And we do have an incredibly large market, so that's we're very fortunate about that. But I, I think that a lot of my founders think too small. They're not thinking globally. But I need partners that are out there. I lean on. It's. I, I don't just count on my team. I have a hundred mentors and uh, and you know. 75 different LPs, and I expect them to be participatory. In fact, if you're an LP in my fund, you, you don't help me, you don't make selections. You don't get to vote on who we're uh, investing in. But I hold a pitch day. Once I narrow that thousand companies down to about a dozen, 
I bring them in, I bring all my investors in to hear them pitch, and I ask my investors for feedback on those companies. That helps me make my selection from 12 down to six. I learn things from my LPs, uh, things that you know I'm not all knowing. <laughs> so they're very smart LPs that you know they have money for a reason. Uh, they've been there, they've been around the world, they've done that. And so I'm looking for partners that want to be involved and want to engage with my founders, want to engage with me, and and help me do exactly what you're talking about. Let's start crossing borders. And, and making companies. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me that there's this great company that does XYZ in the United States, and there's this great company that does XYZ in you know, England. Uh, the, really, you, sh you could, if, you, if I'm as an investor, I want there to just be one of those, <laughs> and I want them to, to own both markets. That's who I want to invest in. So, uh, and whether they originate overseas or they originate in the US, that doesn't matter. Uh, I'm just looking for the very best founder that's sitting on that idea. You know, Judy, um, I mean, you're kind of so cool. Do you ever get into arguments with these entrepreneurs when they uh, lie to you or you have a discussion about whether the MVP has really been hit or whatever and you find yourself in... Because it's, it's a really, you know, uh, it's a burning building. There's a lot of stuff that happens and it just seems like people would find it so hard to have an argument with you. I don't know. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, do you ever get yourself into a situation where you think these, these founders are being absolutely ridiculous? They're you know, all of the stuff that happens. I do occasionally. I try to ferret that out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking for mentorable founders. Um, what I tell my founders when I'm teaching them how to interact with the mentors that I have, I say, if the mentors are giving you advice that you feel like isn't good, the probably that mentor doesn't know enough about your business. If you really feel like they're missing the mark, if it's not ringing true with you, then they don't know enough about your business, which means your communication has failed. And you need to explain to them why it is you think this is poor advice. Make sure they understand it well enough and then tap into their expertise because at the end of the day, somebody that has been through this much life, they really do have, they know more than you do. So if you can just make sure they know everything there is to know, but we never tell them they have to do a thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We don't control. We never control. As an, as an entrepreneur, it goes back to the, I want to be a good VC. I want to support you. So, uh, so I don't get into a lot of those arguments because I try to not invest in people that aren't mentorable and that don't understand that. And then I also try to train them how to be uh, sponges for this kind of information. But every once in a while, you do. I'm going to give you just a fun anecdotal story. I was invested in, uh, I'll go ahead and say it's an Israeli company, so I, I chuckle because they're, they're not, as a culture, uh, totally mentorable. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, and maybe, well, I won't get into that. But, um, but anyway, he wanted to grow, he, he had a, um, uh, so he was in security, right? And he had this great, uh, this, this great business, but he wanted to be a billion dollar company. Like, like this billion, he, he, he really wanted to be the next huge security, but I kept telling him, no, you have this small piece that's going to be bought by McAfee. You know, you have this small, and, and it's going to be great. And, you know, we're going to make a 20x return. Like, you're going to have enough money that you're going to, you can either be set for life, but if you want even more money than that, you can use that money to start your next business. You're not a one-trick pony. You have more ideas in your head. Don't be mistaken. Don't think you're only good for one company. Take this money. Be a success. VCs will love you. They'll give you more money that you need because you've already had a success. We can, you know, have this great IRR. And he just battled me and battled me and battled me. Yeah. And you know what happened? What happened? <laughs> they were bought by McAfee. No. no. <laughs> he, I wish. Uh, he, not yet. Um, he finally, finally agreed with me, and then he left that company and gave it to his right-hand man to run because he just really wanted to build a billion-dollar company. Right, he didn't right. want to build a small company. Wow, wow. <laughs> but, but that's, a, you know, an example of what happens. So yeah. one last question. Without even thinking too much, who is the most impressive entrepreneur that you've, in, you've invested in? Without even just who comes to mind that you've invested in? doing capital innovators? Is there one man, one woman that you think, by God? <sighs> there's, there's, there are several. Um, I'm going to say, uh, can I say two? Of course. Can I say two? Uh, one, his name is Jim Eberlin. 
and he, my, the comp I'm invested in two of his companies. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one he started uh, is now valued at, they, they estimate at, uh, the last estimation was 800 million. Uh, it's probably more than that now. They're headed for an IPO. Mm -hmm. I don't always invest in, I don't look for unicorns. I don't look for IPOs. It just so happens that this just really mm -hmm. flew. Mm -hmm. uh, but he has started multiple mm -hmm. companies. He is definitely a serial entrepreneur. He knows how to get in, build a thing, mm -hmm. and then turn it over to another team to run. Very smart because mm -hmm. he understands when it's time for him to get out mm -hmm. and start his next thing. He understands where he's at. He doesn't need to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. He doesn't have mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. run the billion dollar company. People in that company have probably even forgotten about him. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. he's going to make a ton of money. He's making me a ton of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so he's one because that's okay. unique. Yep, yep. And then the other one is a, is a fairly new investor, I, I mean, investment I've made. And he is just, uh, he is a founder that believes in sales. Mm -hmm. This is hard to come by, a founder <laughs> who understands how to sell. Uh -huh. And it's important uh, because in the early days, uh, if you're the one that is passionate about your business, you're the one that's going to find the early adopters uh -huh. and sell them. Uh -huh. This idea that you're going to hire a salesperson uh -huh. is just it, wrong. It's wrong. So it doesn't and, until yeah. you learn yeah. how to sell it, what your story is, what your product, refine your product, make sure you have the right market. Until you figure all of those things out, you can't possibly turn it over to somebody who isn't in love with your baby yeah. uh, to, to sell it. So you have to learn how to become a salesperson and he he grasped that right away mm -hmm. and and just he, he's almost being frustrated because he has to keep managing he's doing so well now he has to be a CEO and manage people and he would rather be on the phone selling <laughs> so uh, so now he's experiencing that so those are my two favorites Wow well I think we all feel um, rather fortunate to have had you come here I mean it was really exceptional and you're, you're truly amazing thank you oh well thank you so much thank you